The next speaker is Martin Heirer. He was born in 1975 and received the, the Fields Medal in 2014 for his work on stochastic partial differential equations. He grew up in Geneva and holds a PhD in the intersection between physics and mathematics from the University of Geneva. And he had uh, then moved to Warwick in the UK and uh, climbed the ranks in Warwick. And as of this semester, he moved to Imperial College in London. Martin, the floor is yours. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. Uh, so, well, so I suppose I'm the first mathematician to speak here uh, this time around. And so I try to keep it mostly non-technical, uh, but I still wanted to talk a bit about some math. And so I thought that, well, I would try to give you, you know, to talk about the part of my area of mathematics, which is a probability theory, or if you want in layman's terms, that would be the mathematics of randomness. And so I thought I'd start to, you know, from a sort of more philosophical perspective and then sort of go more and more mathematical sort of as the talk progresses. Um, and of course, probability theory sort of lends itself to uh, lots of philosophical spec speculations because it's actually pretty difficult to define what you mean by a probability, right? So in some sense, when do we apply probability theory? It's when we, you know, have some experiment, some situation where we don't possess all the information required in order to predict the outcome. Um, and so we are left to guess, in some sense, uh, what the outcomes could be and how likely the different outcomes could be. And so we assign sort of numbers between zero and one to these outcomes, and you can sort of interpret these numbers in two different ways, roughly speaking. So one of them is sort of subjective, that's you can interpret the probability as being some sort of an a priori guess of the likelihood for a given outcome. Um, and then, you know, so for example, take the, uh, well, I have to come use that example. They take the last US election. Um, so the guess was that, you know, Clinton would win with 90% probability. So at least the New York Times assigned a probability of 90% to her winning. And so that, in some sense, it's sort of a, it's a belief, right? It's, so it's not a probability in the second sense that you will see. Um, of course, many people then said, oh, they got it completely wrong. But OK, maybe they got it wrong. But then on the other hand, you know, things with 10% probability to happen happen really all the time. Right? Um, now, the second way of interpreting this is if the experiment happens to be an experiment that you can reproduce with, you know, say, in the same conditions, unlike an election, uh, which is not reproducible, then, of course, there's a sort of objective definition of a probability, which is, you know, you reproduce the experiment a zillion times, uh, and then it corresponds to the fraction of times that the different outcomes occur. Um, and so, now, if you're a statistician, there are lots of fights somehow between, you know, people who believe more in the first interpretation of probability, who would call themselves Bayesian statisticians, and people who believe more in the second interpretation of probability, who would call themselves frequentist statisticians. Um, of course, as mathematicians, we try to keep out of these fights, and we would argue that, you know, we really don't care because all we care about is the mathematics of this, and that's perfectly well defined. It's completely separate from whatever interpretation in the real world you want to give to the numbers that come out, right? Uh, so that's always a very separate question, and as mathematicians, we have the luxury of just, you know, brushing these questions to the side. Um, so all we do as mathematicians is, in some sense, transforming these probabilities, right? According to the rules that you all know that, for example, if you have two mutually exclusive outcomes, then the probability that one or the other one happens is the sum. If they are independent, then the probability that both of them happen would be the product, and so on. Um, so we mostly transform probabilities, and so you still you know, have to start from somewhere. Um, so where do we, do we start from? 
in, I would argue that there are sort of two big general principles in probability theory that give you a starting point. And the first one is the same as in many other parts of mathematics, which is symmetry. That's right. So if you have an experiment which has a number of possible outcomes, and these outcomes are sort of distinguishable to you as the observer of the experiment, but indistinguishable to the process that produces the outcomes, okay, then there's no reason to expect one more than the other, and so you should assign equal probabilities to all of these outcomes. Right? And of course, that's the classical example where you can tell the difference between head or tail, but the mechanism of spinning the coin doesn't tell the, if the, you know, if the coin is balanced, the mechanism of spinning the coin doesn't tell the difference between head or tails. Right? And therefore, you should assign probability a half to each. Um, the second mechanism is somehow much more subtle and it's uh, much more unique to probability theory and actually theoretical physics. So that's a concept that really comes from theoretical physics, um, which is that of universality. And what this says is that in many situations, if some, if some random outcome is the result of many different independent random inputs interacting in a certain way, uh, then in many cases, the, uh, the details of these inputs really don't matter at all. And the standard example that you all know about is, of course, the central limit theorem here. Right? So the what does the central limit theorem say? Well, OK, so here, the experiment that was done here is you take a coin uh, and you, well, you, know, you simulate a coin in a computer. Uh, you ask the computer to toss the coin 100 times, uh, and then you count the number of heads that you see, and so that will be a number between uh, 0 and 100. And then you perform that experiment 1,000 times, and you see how often do you get the different numbers. And here you see, well, you get... So that would be the 50, that's 51, 49, et cetera, and they sort of roughly arrange according to that curve. And so if you do the same thing 10,000 times, well, it gets kind of closer to this curve. If you do it 100,000 times, uh, then it gets really close to that curve, and that curve, of course, is the Gaussian distribution. And, well, you all know the central li limit theorem, which somehow says that if you add independent random quantities, uh, of about the same size and that don't have two, you know, two large exceptional events, uh, then what you're going to see is approximately a Gaussian distribution, completely independently of the individual distributions of these quantities that you add up, right? And so that's a very, very simple manifestation of this universality which kind of forgets about the details of the many random inputs that produce the one sort of large random output. Um, so just to come back to this symmetry, um, it appears very, very simple, and it's sort of intuitively it's completely obvious. Um, again, when you, you know, try to relate this to a real-world situation, you can easily get yourself confused, or you can fall into traps, okay? And so I'll just try to explain one of these traps uh, just to make the point. So it's a very simple example that I kind of like, uh, which is called the two envelopes paradox. So imagine that I have two envelopes and each of them has a check in it and each check has an amount written on it. Um, and the only information that I give you is that one of the check is for twice as much money than the other one, okay? That's the only information you've got. And then you pick to choose one of the two envelopes. You open it, you look at how much money is written on the check, and then you get to decide. Either you keep the money, or you take the other one. But then if you, may, if you change your mind, then you have to stick to it, right? I mean, you can't go back and say, oh, after all, I prefer the first one, which would happen to be larger, right? Um, so now, so, so what should you do then? Um, well, you know, by symmetry, right? So open the envelope, you see a thousand euro in it, 
Now, you'd say, well, by symmetry, there's a half chance to have 2,000 in the other envelope, and there's a half chance to have 500. And so on average, if I change my mind, on average, I will actually have 1,250 in the other envelope, and so I should obviously change my mind, right? If I change my mind, on average, I get 1,250. If I keep the original one, I get 1,000. Right? So I should change my mind. So I should somehow always change my mind, uh, independently of what I see when I open the envelope. So I could have just changed my mind from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's obviously something silly going on here, right? Um, and of course, the, uh, so the, resolution, the resolution of the paradox here, well, there are sort of two different things that come together. Um, but to, first of all, the resolution of the paradox is that, of course, in the real world, uh, the different possible outcomes here are not symmetric. Okay? So in the sense that if you open the envelope okay, and you see 100,000 euros, what would you do? You know, obviously you just keep the 100,000 euros, right? Because there's too much of a risk of losing 50,000 if you change. And furthermore, you would think that, you know, the guy is crazy enough to give me 100,000 euro, but he probably wouldn't give me 200,000, right? Um, whereas if you see, you know, five euro, then you say, well, why not? You know, it's just a gamble. And so you change your mind, maybe you get 10, right? Uh, so obviously it's actually not quite symmetric in this situation. Uh, and again, you actually have some prior expectation of, you know, the distribution of money that I'm willing to part with in that silly game. Uh, and that would then affect how you react to, you know, when you open the envelope. Um, actually, as an exercise, so for those of you who would go get bored for the lecture, uh, try to come up with a proper mathematical model for this and convince yourself that there are actually mathematical models where still, even if you set it up properly with a proper prior belief and so on, still you should always change your mind, and then explains why that's still not a paradox. <laughs> okay? um, now, so what this illustrates, one thing, is that you know, these notions, even for very, very, very simple sort of situation, it can be actually quite subtle. And one real world sort of consequence of you know, subtleties of very basic probability theory was illustrated a few years ago in the UK uh, in the case of Sally Clark, who maybe some of you, some of you certainly heard about that case. Uh, it made a lot of noise in the press, where there was a family where one of the uh, children, a small infant, died of cot death, sudden infant death. And, well, okay, sort of thing that unfortunately happens occasionally. But then it so happens that two years later, uh, she had another young infant that again died of uh, sudden infant death syndrome. And so then people became suspicious and thought that maybe she had murdered actually both children because it's pretty unlikely that two children in the same family at two years interval would actually die of this. And so there was a court case and an expert witness testified that I'm sort of making up numbers now. I don't remember the exact figures, but something along the lines of, you know, the probability that one child in a family with that kind of middle-class background, etc., dies of sudden infant death syndrome is about one chance it's 20,000. Uh, and so the probability that two of them die is one in 400 million, and therefore she killed them. Uh, which, of course, was complete nonsense because there's absolutely no reason to believe that the two events would be independent if there's any sort of genetic component and Obviously not, uh, but still, so she got actually convicted on that basis and she spent several years in jail and it completely destroyed her life. Um, eventually, the conviction was overturned and so it eventually also destroyed the life of the expert witness. Um, but, so it shows that you really have to be careful even in very simple situations where you sort of apply probability theory to real world situations. Um, but now, so I want to go back to this uh, second concept, so this concept of universality. So here, I already mentioned the center limit theorem, but 
the kind of uh, situations that I have in mind for this lecture is slightly more sophisticated. And here, the, really, the first um, instance is, well, goes back to the early 1800s, actually late 1700s, depending on who you count, um, with Robert Brown, who is a British botanist, observing um, pollen or kind of little, actually smaller particles that are inside the pollen that were floating in water. So he was observing this under a microscope and he saw something like this. So he sees these particles sort of wobbling around and he was wondering, you know, how comes that these particles sort of move around like this even though, well, you know, he was really careful that the water itself wasn't moving. Um, and he, so he left them at rest for quite a long time and still they continued to move like this. So in the beginning he thought that maybe they were alive, um, but then he discarded this. And so of course the explanation then was that, you know, the water is made up of molecules and these molecules move at actually pretty high velocity uh, depending on the temperature. And whenever one of these molecules hits this little grain of pollen, well, it gives it a little kick. And the individual kicks are very, very small, so one of these kicks would be completely imperceptible. But, of course, there are billions and billions of molecules of water, uh, and so these kicks happen at a very, very high frequency. And, you know, the total sum of all of these kicks does actually produce a macroscopic motion, which now we call Brownian motion. And so you see, so this is a situation where, again, in order to understand Brownian motion, you'll see in a second mathematically, you really don't actually need to understand the precise details of the mechanism which produces the interaction between uh, the molecules of water and the particle pollen, okay? So, even, you know, if you change the size of these, these particles or you change the type of fluid you're in, you really would change the microscopic mechanism, right? So the molecules would look very different if you put water or alcohol, for example, or whatever. So the details of the microscopic mechanism would be very different, but what you see macroscopically is still exactly the same, which is some movie like that. Um, so when you want to explain this, so the sort of mathematical tools for describing this, um, they really go back to this guy, uh, Joseph Fourier, who was a French scientist, also back in the early 1800s. And of course, he's very well known for two things. The first, for the computer scientists in the room, he's very well known for one thing. <laughs> uh, so he's, of course, very well known for the Fourier transform, Fourier analysis, uh, which is used all the time in digital signal processing, which really says that you can, you know, approximate any signal or any periodic signal by a superpos superposition of sine waves. Um, but then he's also very well known, at least to the physicists and mathematicians, for Fourier's law. And so Fourier's law gives you an equation that uh, describes the propagation of heat in a material. Okay, so, so it's a partial differential equation like this, which tells you, well, if you take, say, a block of metal uh, and you heat it up on one side, you cool it down on the other side, so you start with some kind of temperature profile in that block of metal, and then how does this temperature profile evolve over, over time? Okay, so it follows what's now called the heat equation. Um, and that heat equation is actually derived using something called Fourier's law, which tells you that the heat flux is proportional to the temperature gradient. Um, now, the two are actually related, because if you want to solve the heat equation, you kind of do it by Fourier transform as well. And now, why does Fourier, what does this have to do with my story about Brownian motion? Right? It doesn't have anything to do with heat, a priori. But actually, if you look at the evolution of probabilities there, it turns out that they follow the same equation. So, so what you do, so you look at one of these little particles that move around here, right? So you see it in a certain location. Um, and then you close your eyes, 
and two seconds later you open your eyes and so now you don't know where that particle is, right? So you want to predict where this particle will be, so it will be at a random location. Um, and so what you'd want to do is you want to predict some kind of probability distribution of where is it more likely to find a particle, where is it less likely to find a particle. And you would like to find, you know, some kind of equation that governs this probability distribution. It so turns out that that equation is exactly the same. So it's also the heat equation. So the evolution of that probability satisfies the exact same equation as, you know, the propagation of heat in a piece of metal. And so this was actually used by, I think it was probably first actually really written down by Einstein in uh, 1905 in one of his famous 1905 papers, um, where he really gave a theory of Brownian motion, it was more or less at the same time as Smoroshovsky. So Smoroshovsky also gave a theory of Brownian motion independently of Einstein at around the same time. Um, where what he did as well, so first he made the link between the heat equation and you know, the actual Brownian motion that Brown observed under the microscope. And he also linked, you know, the, so in this equation there was a coefficient, well, okay, here I just set all the coefficients to one, but in principle there's a coefficient somewhere here in front of uh, the second derivative. So he actually expressed also this coefficient in terms of the, you know, various properties um, of the fluid that you're observing and of the particles that move in this fluid. And so he actually came up with a prediction for this coefficient based on the assumption that you know, water is made up of molecules and that the story that I told you earlier is true, which at the time was accepted but not experimentally verified. Okay? So at the time, people were pretty certain that matter is made of molecules, but there hadn't been any absolutely conclusive experiment yet that really demonstrated the fact that matter was made of molecules, so there were still competing theories around. And so Einstein came up with that prediction for this diffusion coefficient, which then uh, Perrin actually experimentally verified a few years later in 1908. Um, and so he then got the, got the Nobel Prize for this in, uh, in 1926. And that's considered to be you know, the first experimental work that actually uh, demonstrated the existence of atoms and molecules. Um, now, interestingly, so you see what happens here is that you have subsets independently of the underlying microscopic mechanism. What you see at the macroscopic level here is described by something very simple here, which is this heat equation, which depends on very few parameters. So here there's only one parameter in the heat equation, which is this diffusion coefficient, even though at the microscopic level, well, you know, if you want to describe all possible solvents that you could observe, all possible types of particles you could observe in these solvents, you know, you would write models with zillions of parameters, right? So at the end of the day, at a large level, this all crystallizes into just one parameter, and this is somehow this, you know, universality. Uh, that I was mentioning. So interestingly here, exactly the same mechanism also arises in different areas. So at around the same time as uh, Einstein's work, actually a few years earlier, there was another young French guy called Bachelier who was interested in the evolution of stock prices. And so the story that he sort of told himself is that, well, so how does the price of a stock change? Well, people trade that stock, and whenever you make a trade, if you sell the stock, then um, there's a little bit more offer for the stock, and so the prices should go down a bit. And whereas if you try to buy a stock, well, there's a little bit more demand, and so the price should go slightly up. And of course, if you or me trade a stock, um, since I don't think there's any billionaire in the room, uh, you know, it would have a really microscopic effect on the price of the stock, right? So it would be a little bit like a water molecule hitting one of these grains of pollen. It would essentially have no effect. But then there are thousands and thousands of people trading the stock at the same time. And so at the end of the day, there's sort of all these trades actually accumulate to some macroscopic effect on the price of the stock. 
And so you see that at the heuristic level, the mechanism is kind of the same as the mechanism that gives rise to Brownian motion, even though at the microscopic level it's completely different. It really has nothing to do with each other. But so the universal sort of mathematical object that is expected to govern this is again the same. And so Bachelier in his thesis in 1900, again made the link to the heat equation for the evolution of stock prices for exactly the same reason. So he sort of derived the heat equation in pretty much the same way as Einstein derived it in his papers, but in the context of the evolution of stock prices. Um, interestingly, he never really got a permanent job for this even, uh, but you know, he sort of laid the foundations for modern mathematical finance nevertheless. Now, so mathematically, this was really put on kind of solid grounds then later in the 20s, so at MIT, Wiener is famous in the probabilistic, in the probability community, Wiener is famous for what's now called the Wiener process, which is really build an actual mathematical object that describes this Brownian motion, not just like this heat equation, which just tells you somehow how some of these probability densities evolve, but really build an actual notion of a random function of time um, and make this precise mathematically. Um, so this is when now mathematicians talk about the Brownian motion, what they think of is a probability measure on a space of continuous function and the typical continuous function on that pro under this probability measure would somehow look like this. Uh, and for example, Donska in the 50s, so he was probably the first to kind of formulate and prove a quite general mathematical theorem that, you know, demonstrates this universality of Brownian motion in the sense that, you know, it roughly states something along the lines, you know, you can take many tif different types of random processes when you look at some you know, kind of additive functionals of these, and you look at what happens at long times, what you see is a Brownian motion. Um, so let me just, let me, so here is an example of a Brownian motion, right? So a Brownian motion, you take just one sample of a Brownian motion, so it's a random continuous function, so I just took one instance of such a function, and when do, what I'm doing here is I take that function, I just zoom out to show you how it looks like at every scale, and what you see is that it sort of looks the same at every scale, okay? So it's some sort of fractal object. Um, and the point of these two parabolas here is to show that what I'm doing is I zoom out in such a way that these two parabolas stay constant, okay? So when I zoom out by a factor four horizontally, I actually zoom out by a factor two vertically, which is just the thing that keeps that parabola constant. So we say that it has parabolic scaling or scaling exponent one-half, where the one-half corresponds to the, you know, x to the one-half graph, which draws the parabola. Um, so this is Brownian motion. But now this is a one-dimensional object, which is somehow universal, and so it shows up in many different areas of well, in physics and in mathematical finance. Um, what about higher dimensions? So say, what would be a two-dimensional? So the simplest way of building a Brownian motion is to do a random walk, which is you look at simply all possible step functions, so functions that only change by plus minus one at every step, and you just pick one at random, and if you do this and you look at what it looks like at large scales, it looks like a Brownian motion. Now you could do the same thing in two dimensions. So you take a two-dimensional grid, say like this honeycomb lattice here, um, and then you look at just all possible value functions from that grid into the integers that change by plus minus one when you cross an edge. Um, and then you can ask yourself, well, if I take, just pick one of these functions at random, so you give all of them equal probability, and then you look at what they look like at very large scales. So in this case, well, for this particular very simple example, or you could even just take the square lattice, would be the same thing. We know what happens in the sense that one has a conjecture and very good reasons to believe that the conjecture is true, 
but we don't even have a mathematical theorem in that case. So even in this very, very, very simple case, so to take the simplest, almost the simplest generalization to Brownian motion, which has been sort of known for ages and ages to two dimensions, one doesn't actually have a theorem. So here one has a conjecture, so one knows that at large scales it's supposed to behave like an object called the free field. Uh, and so this here is a computer simulation of this free field. Um, this here is a computer simulation of, you know, the actual problem that I just showed you with the hexagonal grid and you just pick one of these functions and you plot the function. Um, and you, well, okay, so I tried to pick this co color scheme so that they more or less look the same, but obviously didn't get the scales quite right. Uh, but, you know, if you look at the sort of structures you see, it's certainly plausible to believe that they are kind of the same object. Um, but there's still no mathematical theorem that actually states that. Now, um, in statistical mechanics, so these are, this is, again, sort of, a, sort of a free object in the sense that you just look at all possible functions and just pick one at random without trying to give them any sort of prior likelihood or anything like this. Um, and so that's what we would call sort of a free object. And of course, in physics, often you're interested in interacting objects rather than free objects. And so the simplest one here is the Ising model, which uh, actually goes back to the, I don't remember, early 20s or even, even later, than, even earlier than that. I don't remember, but it goes back a very long time. It's sort of the simplest toy model uh, for a magnet, where what you do is you just you have a grid, so say a two-dimensional, three-dimensional grid. At every point of the grid, a configuration is simply an assignment of either plus one or minus one to every point on the grid. And so you imagine that each point of the grid is a little atom, and it has a spin that either points up or down. And then instead of giving them all the same likelihood, so you, instead of giving all configurations the same probability, what you say is that you spins tend to want to align with each other. And so what you do is you give a given configuration a probability proportional to this factor here, where you look at all neighboring points, so you look at all possible neighbors on your grid, and so X and Y are positions on your grid that are neighbors, uh, and you look at the two spins, sigma X, sigma Y, um, and you see that if they're aligned, then this is positive, because it's either one times one, which is one, or it's minus one times minus one, which is also one. Um, and so then this is e to the something positive, whereas if they are not aligned, then this is minus one, right? So it's one, either one times minus one or minus one times one, which is negative. And so you have e to something negative, which is smaller than one. And so you give somehow larger, you assign larger probability to the configurations where many spins are aligned and smaller probability to those where they are not aligned. And there's one parameter in here, which is the temperature, which sort of tells you how important this effect is. So in some sense, the larger the temperature, the more things get disordered and don't care about the alignments of neighbors, and the smaller the temperatures, the more they do care about the alignment of neighbors. And then if you simulate this, what you see is something like this. So at a low temperature, you see something like that, where basically most of the spins are aligned. So you see mostly, so here, say yellow is plus and black is minus. So you see mostly pluses with a few minuses scattered around, or mostly minuses with a few pluses scattered around. At very high temperature, it's all just mixed up. You see more or less, you see pluses and minuses in the same proportion, and they more or less occur randomly. Um, and somewhere in between, there's a transition between the two behaviors where you see something interesting, right? So this is clearly the most interesting of the three pictures. Um, and there what you see is you really see structure at all scales. So here at some point you see, you know, very large regions with mostly pluses, but then even larger regions with mostly minuses inside even larger regions with pluses and so on. So you start to see actually structure at all scales. And so here, the, uh, well, the theorem 
here is that if you take this specific model, well, there is one specific value of the temperature where this kind of behavior happens, where you have this transition from one behavior to the other. And if you're exactly at that value, then you, know, you can look at what happens at very large scales. And there is a non-trivial mathematical object that somehow describes the large scale kind of scaling limit um, of, this kind of, uh, of this kind of system. So that's a mathematical theorem the conjecture is that it really doesn't matter that you look at this particular model. You know, take your favorite model of what's supposed to happen inside a magnet, your favorite model which has roughly these features, well, it should have the same kind of transition, and if you're at the transition and you look at what happens at large scales, you should see exactly the same mathematical object. Okay? Uh, and this is a conjecture because we basically can't prove it for almost any model. So there's a, well, one big breakthrough was actually Stas Smirnov, who showed that it's still true for a larger class of model where you somehow, instead of looking at a perfect, well, square or triangular grid, uh, you take somehow a larger class of models where the grid is allowed to be a bit more general, but there's still quite a bit of rigidity in the result, and it's still restricted to models of exactly this type. Okay, but the conjecture is that it's way more general than that. Um, so let me show, I can show you actually just a movie. So this is like the animated version of the same kind of model where here, you know, there's also time in the picture. So these regions actually move around. And again, one, is ex one conjectures that there is, you know, one universal mathematical object, which now is a field not just on space, but on space time. Uh, which somehow describes the you know, scaling limit of this movie. Um, and again, here one doesn't even know what the correct value of the scaling exponent in time is. So the analog of the one half for the Brownian motion. So one doesn't even know the value of that exponent. Okay, you can do numerical simulation, so you can look it up on Wikipedia, but it's somehow known to three digits or whatever based on numerical simulations. <clears throat> okay, so, so let me just give a few recap, a few sort of common probabilities. So you have these universal objects that are supposed to describe the large-scale behavior of these interacting random systems. Um, in general, they are, so in the case of Brownian motion, they're Gaussian. In the case of that free field, it's also Gaussian. In general, they are not. Um, so in general, you don't necessarily expect closed form nice expressions uh, for these distributions. Now, they have a few properties that come from the way they are built, right? So, so the sort of system that we're looking at here are things that have some kind of translation invariance, at least in some statistical sense. And then what you're interested in is the behavior at very large scales. So it's some sort of limit of the process of zooming out and therefore almost by definition, if you get a limit, that limit should itself be invariant under the process of zooming out, right? Uh, so it should have some scale invariance. Then for all of these systems, they sort of come from local interactions and therefore in the limit, local sort of should become zero. And what this tells you is that they should have some kind of Markov property in the sense that you should get a sort of a random field, but with the property that if you look at some, what happens inside of a region conditioned to the behavior outside of the region, then this should only depend on the boundary of the region. Okay, so in some sense, information is sort of transmitted locally and not at a distance. Um, and then you expect, well, at least in some cases here, like in the case of this easing model, you expect to get rotation invariance also, uh, and therefore, you expect conformal invariance. So in two dimensions, this gives you a lot of rigidity. So in two dimensions, conformal invariance is a very rich structure. So obviously in the last one minute, I'm not going to have any time to explain that, but somehow this conformal invariance gives you a lot, buys you a lot in two dimensions. And so in two dimensions, in some sense, one can kind of characterize 
all of these objects. So there's in two dimensions, there's a one parameter family of objects of this type, which is parametrized by something like the scaling exponent. Um, and they are called conformal field theories. And they essentially describe or are conjectured to describe the large scale behavior of pretty much any uh, model, two dimensional model of statistical mechanics that you can imagine, as long as you know, your description of it is somewhat stationary and kind of local or something like that. Um, in higher dimensions, we have basically no clue. So, you know, it sounds like a relatively simple mathematical question, right? I mean, you say, describe all the random fields that have these properties, the stationary, scale invariant, Markovian, and say maybe rotation invariant. In one dimension, you can do it, so it's called the stable Levy processes. It's a one parameter family that just depends on the exponent. So you just pick the exponent. If you pick a half, you get Brownian motion. Uh, you can pick any exponent between zero and one. You have a family of processes, and we know that it's sort of the only ones. Um, and actually, in some sense, the only realistic one in that family is Brownian motion. So all the others sort of involve large jumps and things, and so they are, in some sense, not so common. So in one dimension, we know that there's really a special one, which is Brownian motion, and in some sense, it's kind of the only one. So it makes it extremely rigid. Uh, and so in higher dimension, you expect the same kind of rigidity, uh, and it's very much what modern theoretical physics is based on. So it's sort of based on the belief that, you know, pick a dimension, pick an exponent, there should be basically just one object like that, which corresponds to it. And then that is the object that you would actually observe in nature somehow for a given dimension, given system with given, uh, given scaling exponents. But there's absolutely no mathematical theorem whatsoever. So here there's, there's really a lot of things to do. Um, there's one thing that we've... So there are some situations where you can do things. Um, in particular, so recently, so I've personally been working on the case of somehow trying to understand what's called crossover regimes, where you have somehow two of these objects, one of them is Gaussian, and so you easily understand it, one is non-Gaussian, so you don't understand it, you don't even know that it exists. Um, and then you try to understand sort of like the crossover from one to the other. So you, build, you look at models where you have a parameter that you can tune, and depending on the parameter, it falls into sort of either one universality class or the other, and then you sort of tune it so that it's close to the Gaussian one, but you zoom out sufficiently far so that you see a behavior which is non-Gaussian, and then you try to describe what you see there, uh, and heuristically, what you then see is typically described by a stochastic partial differential equation, which you can sort of heuristically derive and write down. Um, and these equations tend to have the nasty habit of not having any meaning a priori when you just write them down. Because, so for example, in say one dimensional interface growth model, you end up, so there you end up sort of trying to describe some you know, process of this type here. Um, and it turns out that the equation that describes this process involves a right-hand side that has the square of the derivative of the solution, and the solution is plainly not differentiable. So if you look at this, it doesn't really have a slope at any point, right? The slope is kind of infinite at every point here. Uh, and so you write down an equation which involves the square of the slope. It's not clear what it means at all. Um, so this, at least now, we can we have a consistent way of giving meaning to these kind of equations. So there's these, so these kind of crossover regimes one actually understands reasonably well uh, what happens there. And so, well, let me just finish with a few conclusions. I think I'm sort of out of time. So probably the most important one is the last one. Uh, and I'll finish here. <laughs> Thank you very much.